This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We broke down the Thursday games of the men's Sweet 16 on yesterday's show. It is time now to shift focus and break down the Friday games. And who better to do so than John Rothstein of CBS Sports and the College Hoops Today podcast. We're going to pick his brain on everything going down this weekend, what we saw this past weekend, and get you ready for some college hoops once again. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here, as mentioned, by John Rothstein. Find him on Twitter at John Rothstein, a very busy Twitter account these past couple of days. Uh, we can find John on CBS Sports and the College Hoops Today podcast. John, I know it is a crazy time of year for you between – coaching news between yeah. the tournament for sure but i appreciate the time how you doing today jim great to be with you man this is march we sleep in may absolutely no sleep until then you're a busy guy so we're gonna get you on your way here in a second but i want to ask you how the opening weekend go you know it seems like there was a lot of fun basketball uh did you take some time to actually get to enjoy things between all the madness you know what? March to me is like when, and you know, I'm not a fast person, but it's like, you know, when you kind of like do your sprinting on the treadmill and you're at <laughs> nine or 10 and you're giving it all you have. Yeah. That's what it's kind of like until yeah. I get on the plane on that Tuesday after the national championship game from Houston. You're constant, constant, constant moving, 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 and it doesn't stop and it's not going to stop. But the hope is that when the national championship game ends and you get on that flight to go from Houston back to New York, that you feel like all of the major stories are done. You can come home, you can get a haircut, you can take your dry cleaning in. Maybe you can reintroduce yourself to the gym so you get in a little bit better shape. <laughs> and then maybe you can try to hope to have a beer or two. Absolutely. Well, uh, that's the goal as always. We're going to try to see, try to prognosticate what we can think about that Tuesday and break down the national championship futures and also talk about these Friday games. As mentioned, though, if you want thoughts on the Thursday games in the NCAA tournament, we talked about those with Dr. Ed Feng of the Power Rank on yesterday's show. You can find that on Covering the Spread, but also over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Let's start things off, John, though, by taking a look back at this past weekend because we saw a lot of good basketball, but also I think we could have some interesting takeaways from that opening weekend. So when you reflect back on what we saw across the first two rounds, what was your biggest takeaway about this year's field? The parity that we expected to see really resonating in a lot of different areas. And, you know, I think the best way to encapsulate that is that we looked at FAU as a Cinderella possibility before the tournament. And FD, FAU looked like Goliath because they were playing FDU. <laughs> beat a one seed in what was, you know, the biggest upset in the history of the NCAA tournament. I think that and also the fact that Princeton, a program, again, that lost Ethan Wright to Colorado because there's no 50-year rule to come back for in the Ivy League. They lost, obviously, Jalen Llewellyn to Michigan off a team that didn't win the Ivy League. And then they were able to go and win multiple games in the NCAA tournament. That's an incredible accomplishment. And they won, Princeton did, in two different styles. Against Arizona, it was a vintage Princeton game. They dragged the opponent into the mud. They obviously slowed down Arizona, who was a potent offensive team. And then against Missouri, they put up over 75 points. So it was really a tale of two games for Princeton. But it goes to show you just how incredible, again, this tournament is. And, you know, Jim, you know, one thing, too, three years ago, we all lost the NCAA tournament because of COVID. Yeah. I think it's important because everybody is so, you know, look always looking forward to the next thing. Let's just take a minute to and appreciate that we have it back, even if it's been back for a couple of years. I mean, it's easy to appreciate it, too, when the basketball is so good. But I think that it makes it even more important to have it that we have it at all. So it's the two layers, the great basketball, the great stories combined with the fact that we have it at all. That makes this year, I think, especially important. Now, I want to go back to the parity discussion you were having, because when we look at the futures market right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook, we have Alabama at plus 320, Houston at four to one. And they're not like runaway favorites, John, but like there is a gap between them and the field. When you look at the parity we saw in that opening weekend, do you think that that discussion also applies to those two schools? Or is it more so the parity behind them is the big thing heading forward? I mean, the parity behind them, Jim. And yeah. I think that's the interesting thing. Like, Alabama is a really, really good team. I don't see 2015 Kentucky there. I don't see Towns and Booker and the Harrison Twins and Tyler Eulis. Houston is a really, really good team. Houston was a team, though, that was pushed by Northern Kentucky and losing to Auburn at the half. So everybody's vulnerable in this NCAA tournament. 
Yeah, and I think that that's important to see here is we, again, haven't seen things shorten too much. Houston was 5-1 to one at the start of the tournament, now 4-1. to one. Part of that's because uh, Sass are not looking fully, fully healthy in those first couple of games. They did appear vulnerable a bit. Uh, Alabama has shortened quite a bit. They've been impressive. Their path is pretty good at plus 320. When you look at the hierarchy, John, do you feel as though Alabama, Houston are a full tier above the field based on what we've seen? No, before? no. Okay. Uh, I, and again, I don't expect this to happen. Yeah. I picked Houston and Alabama to win their next games. But yeah. if you and I are talking on Saturday and say, hey, do you believe Miami's in the Elite Eight and San Diego State slowed down Alabama in 160 to 57? I wouldn't be shocked. Sure. This is college basketball in 2023. And here's one big thing you have to look at. This is not a seven-game series. This is a one-game tournament in terms of elimination. San Diego State has seven seniors and two juniors. That is a big thing to keep an eye on when they go toe-to-toe with the Crimson Tide, who, again, I think have the highest ceiling out of anybody left in the NCAA tournament. So it sounds like things are wide open, even at the top here, for uh, the final couple rounds of the NCAA tournament. Let's take a look here. We're going to break down the Friday games more in depth, John, but I did want to give you a chance to talk about the Thursday games. Anything stand out to you when you look at the Thursday games across the Sweet 16? Well, I think, you know, UConn has a distinct advantage over Arkansas inside with Klingon and Sonogo. Arkansas is going to have to go over the top of UConn's defense to win in this game. But Arkansas, in its first two NCAA tournament games, just six of 26 from three-point range. I look at the matchup, obviously, between Michigan State and Marquette, and I've said this time and time again, Michigan State this year reminds me a lot of the 2015 run that they had with Travis Trice to the Final Four as a seven seed. Tom Izzo has told me multiple times in the talks we've had over the years that, you know, he believes that when things are really balanced in college basketball, like they are this year, Mm -hmm. like they were when they got to the Final Four in 2010, it makes you feel the losses a little bit more. And what I mean by that is he talks to me all the time about 2010 because he's like, hey, we lost Kalen Lucas to an injury in the NCAA tournament, but we still got to a Final Four. And there wasn't a great team in that Final Four. He goes, Butler was really good. They beat us by two. Duke won the national title, but it wasn't a great Duke team. We had a chance to win it, and we didn't win it. So I look at Michigan State now as the team to watch in this region to get to a Final Four, which would be Izzo's ninth trip to the Final Four, and again, to compete for a national championship. Yeah, Michigan State now currently actually a favorite over Kansas State, uh, over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Michigan State, one and a half point favorite. Do you think that it's fair to view Michigan State as being a hair bit better than Kansas State for this opening that that Thursday game? I would because of Tom Izzo. Yeah. And and I also love the fact that they play the two point guards together with Hogarth and Tyson Walker. You know, so much has been made, Jim, about Tyson Walker's offense. He doesn't have a turnover in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's going to be a fun one to watch. Again, Michigan State, slight favorite over Kansas State, but John thinks they could be in play beyond just that game as well. Okay, let's talk about these Friday games. Let's start things off in the South. we got Alabama against San Diego State. As you mentioned before, wouldn't be a huge shocker to see San Diego State playing on into uh, the Sunday games. Creighton playing against Princeton, that great story there. Creighton's a team you pinpointed back in December once they got healthy as a team that could make some noise, and here they are on the second weekend. So looking at these two games in the South specifically, John, what stands out to you? How do you see these games playing out? Well, you know, the South region is an interesting region because I said of the contrast you have in the first game and then the great underdog situation in the second game. I'm taking Alabama and Creighton. I'm taking Alabama to get to the Final Four. Yeah, Alabama right now in that game, seven and a half point favorite against South, or, uh, San Diego State. Do you think that the gap is that large? Do you think San Diego State can keep things close and push throughout the entire game? What's your view of them? in terms of how big that gap is. If San Diego State has a chance to win this game, it's going to have to be in the 60s. It's going to have to be comparable to what Princeton did against Arizona. And also, looking over to the other side of the bracket, what UCLA is going to have to do against Gonzaga. I don't think UCLA can beat Gonzaga if the score gets above 70. Yeah, and Gonzaga, uh, we talked about this with Ed yesterday, a team that he likes as far as betting their money line, potentially their plus two and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook as well. And if San Diego State does slow things down, keep the possession numbers lower, that could be beneficial in terms of the spread. But does sound like John favors Alabama there. Princeton Creighton spread is nine and a half. And you've talked a lot about this Creighton team as being a team that um, – that you liked a lot early on. I think they have justified that enthusiasm through their first two games. How do they match up in your eyes with this Princeton team? 
it's a mental game, right? Because Creighton is probably looking at this and says, you know, we have a path to get to the Elite Eight. The way that Princeton is going to have to beat Creighton is going to have to be by minimizing turnovers, which is going to be difficult because Nemhard and Alexander are so good at getting out in transition. It's going to have to be by going over the top of Ryan Kalkbrenner. So they're going to have to be a better offensive team than they were against Arizona and probably more comparable to what they did offensively against Missouri. And they're going to have to stay in the game for the first 30 minutes. The whole key to an upset in the NCAA tournament is getting the favorite to be able to emotionally crack. I think that yeah. happened a little bit by Arizona in the last three or four minutes of the game. And we'll see what uh, what you know goes on from there. But I think staying in the game is obviously going to be very important. Yeah, and I think that with Creighton, with the makeup of their team, I think that that does make them pretty well suited in the situation as a nine and a half point favorite against Princeton. Okay, let's talk about the games in the Midwest. We got uh, Miami taking on Houston. That spread is now seven and a half. Texas against Xavier, a four and a half point spread. So a little bit tighter between these two games here. What do you see? Let's start things off with the Houston versus Miami game, John. How do you think that one plays out? Great guard play. Norchad O'Meara has been dynamic on the offensive and defensive glass to start. You know, Houston is the tougher team. Houston, I think, has, you know, more of an edge up front. I would give the edge to Houston. Now, they've had some time to get healthier. Do you think that that plays into it? Do you think that they will come out of this, come into this game, I guess, like as a more full team than they were in those first two rounds? I think so. I, I think one thing we can't ever take for granted is the fact that you have a situation where during the Sweet 16, you get the extra four or five days to rest and recuperate. Right. And that's the one thing. You're going to be a lot fresher for that first Sweet 16 game than you were for your game in the round of 32. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, that's one big thing to keep in mind. Especially with this Houston team, given yeah. all the moving pieces they have there. So that's a factor there for them against Miami. Again, that spread is seven and a half. Uh, Xavier against Texas, that spread is four and a half. And this one seems pretty interesting. Of the Friday games, probably the most competitive one. What are you seeing in that one? Well, Sean Miller is four and three in Sweet 16 games in his career. This is Rodney Terry's first Sweet 16 game. You know, he's the coach at Texas. He should be the permanent coach at Texas, hopefully here soon. He's done more than enough to receive that title. Depth, to me, is a big key in this game. Now, we know that Xavier's depth dissipated a bit when Jerome Hunter moved into the starting lineup for Zach Fremantle. Texas is the deepest team in college basketball. Texas, I think, has the best bench in college basketball. So I give the nod to Texas because I picked them early in the tournament. But in terms of experience in the second weekend, Sean Miller has great experience from a coaching perspective, but Xavier's team does not. When we're talking about like modeling things out, um, you can weigh separate things in a different way. So you can weigh offense, defense, et cetera, et cetera, all these factors. How much does your weight you apply to coaching shift the deeper we get into the tournament? I think you have to look at it really, really closely. And I think, you know, all these guys who are coaching right now are elite coaches. I mean, you look at the West region, the region of brands, Eric Musselman's eight and two in the last you know, two NCAA or the last three NCAA tournaments. Dan Hurley's resume of building programs speaks for itself. McCronin's, you know, coached in the final four. Mark Fuse coached in the final four. So I think all these things, you know, come into play when you're talking about being in a situation to evaluate coaching at this level of the tournament. So you look at a situation where Xavier is a four and a half point underdog facing off against Texas. As you mentioned, Texas has the depth edge, but a lot of experience in that in that in that coaching staff. Do you think that can bridge that four and a half point gap to make this game super? Yeah, obviously, as you said, you favor Texas in this game. Do you think that that keeps things competitive throughout the entire game? I think so. I mean, look, the one thing that I think you got to feel good about if you're Xavier right now, Sule Boom has not played his best basketball in the NCAA tournament. Sule Boom is eight of 26 from the field and two of 12 from three. And Xavier is in the Sweet 16. That's an incredible, incredible feat when you think about it. Think about it. And I also think, you know, we're, we're still going to find out again what's going to happen with Xavier defensively against Dylan DeSue, who has been one of the breakout stars of the NCAA tournament. And Dylan DeSue, again, is somebody who could pose a real problem for Jack Nunji. Xavier's going to need to have Jack Nunji on the floor in this game. Yeah, and you think about um, uh, if they have gotten to this point, they have beaten quality opponents and are maybe not playing their best basketball yet. That implies there is a ceiling they've not tapped into yet, and that could be uh, beneficial as a four-and-a-half-point dog 
on Friday. That's going to do it all for John Rothstein for today. John, check him out on Twitter at John Rothstein. Check him out on CBS Sports. Find his College Hoops Today podcast wherever you get your podcasts as well. John, I know no sleep just yet, but hopefully you can take some time to decompress across the next day or so. Back in action once again tomorrow. Have fun, and we'll talk to you again soon. We sleep in, Meg. Thanks, Jim. All righty. Again, find John on Twitter at John Rossi. I want to thank you once again for swinging by for today. As a reminder, if you want to find the full breakdown of the Thursday games, find that over on the Covering the Spread podcast feed and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. We talked to Ed about his thoughts on all of those games. This March, protect yourself against upsets with Bracket Parlay Insurance on FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, all customers can get up to $25 back each day if your parlay of three legs or more falls one leg short. With a parlay, you can turn a small bet into a slam dunk, and with cash out, you're calling the shots. You can close out your bet whenever you want before the game is over, just sign in to your FanDuel Sportsbook account. Make every moment more of FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Must be 21 plus and in select states. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max bonus bet $25 per day unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. FanDuel is offering online the sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas Star Casino LLC. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. That's going to wrap things up for today here on Covering the Spread. But we are back once again tomorrow with Tom Vecchio. We're going to talk to him about some NBA, talk some NHL. We'll have some more college basketball talk coming up on Friday. Austin Cass will be back with us. We're going to talk to him about the Saturday games in the Elite Eight. So we'll be breaking down uh, those games there. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast to get these as they're posted. We'll also talk some NASCAR on Friday's show as well. Big thank you once again to John Rothstein. Find him on Twitter at John Rothstein and the College Hoops Today podcast. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across the Sweet 16 and the men's side. We'll talk to you all once again soon. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 